Hello everybody and welcome to Story Church. Whether you are joining us online or in person, we are so glad that you are here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We just have a few quick announcements this morning that we're excited about and the first is happening today. You heard that right, our next step brunch class is directly following service during teardown. We love if you had hopefully signed up, but if not, we still want you to attend. This is if you're new to Story Church, want to ask some questions, learn what we're all about. It's an opportunity for you to meet and ask and hang out with one of us for us to be able to get to know your story. It's about 45 minutes directly following service. We'll have some food items in there. Kids are welcome. And so we hope you would stay and join us after service. The next announcement is that we are going to be doing a school supply drive for the teachers here at East Ridge Middle School. And so they're looking for donations of dry erase markers, graph paper, tissues, sanitizing wipes, hand sanitizer, and um, just those things. <laughs> and so if you could go ahead and bring in some of those in the course of the next few Sundays in August, we want to be able to bless the school with those things that are needed. They are never, ever, ever going to stop needing those all school year long. And so if you could bring some of those items in over the course of the next Sundays, that would be an amazing, amazing blessing to the school from Story Church. We really are so glad that you joined us. If you're first or second time, guest here. Welcome to Story Church. We're so glad that you are here. There's a physical connection on the bulletin beside you if you're in service or you can scan the QR code and also fill it out online. And if you're watching online, of course, scan the QR code and fill it out online. We want to reach out to you. Say hello. Thank you for coming. We know looking for a new church can be awkward and we're just so excited that you would spend your Sunday morning here with us or watch us online. We hope you enjoy the service. Woo -woo. Okay, here I am again. Hello. <laughs> uh, we're so thankful that you guys are here this with us this morning. Next week, we will have a graphic up that kind of has that list of school supplies that we're going to be looking for. We'll have a bin in the back as we start collecting those for the months of August. We want to bless the staff here at this school, right? Less that they have to buy out of pocket is always great. So once again, that's not specifically for students. They have their supply list. There's some organizations helping them with school supplies if they're needed. And so we want to step in and help the staff. Sound good? All right. Also, something that I didn't mention in those announcements that I want to make clear is that small groups for fall are launching in August. And so right now we're going to be having a men's group and a women's group. Whoop, whoop. And so those are online under the events page. So if you go to our website, storychurchfl.com, you'll find the groups. What It says when they're happening, what time of the week. Sound good? So we'd love to get some ladies in some groups, amen, some guys in some groups were excited about that time over fall, um, man, just to like talk about life, right, to like come together, learn more about Jesus, share stories, and go through this thing together, it's so different, a small group experience than it is even coming on Sunday, even to a small church, there's so much that Pastor Spencer and I know um, maybe personally that you guys are going through. And then we're like, oh, I wish they would just get to talk to so-and-so, right? Because I know they've been through that. Or, man, they're so similar in that way. And that's what the small groups are really for, for us to iron sharpen iron, to get further in the word, to grow in God. Amen? Amen? All right, so that was it for announcements. And so we're just going to jump right into the message. Sound good? Okay, so we are in the book of John, and we've been in the book of John. Even last week, we had an awesome time. We had a game show here. Who was here for that and competed in our game show? We played, the whole church played Family Feud against each other. It was so fun. It was so fun. Pastor Spencer's team won. Not that it was rigged or anything, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but we had so much fun, but we also recorded an online video that went up in this John series on Wednesday, and so technically in person, this is part three, but we're actually even in part four, so we've really been in the book of John. Now, like we've said, and I'm going to say again, 
please know this is not an exhaustive study of the book of John. We are not able to go line by line. That would take us all year. There are some churches that do that, but this is us getting deeper into what does it mean that Jesus was the word became flesh and dwelt among us? I mean, it's so easy in a Bible study or in our maybe daily abide time to just glance over that first chapter in John and not like get the chills like the word became flesh and the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. What? You're saying Jesus? It's so big. But there is nothing sweeter than preparing an entire message about Jesus. I just have to tell you that. You cannot go wrong, okay? So first, let's look back at like where we've been. So this is our in-person part three of our overview of the book of John. We are looking now, if you missed two Sundays ago, Pastor Spencer started the first chunk of Jesus's miracles and traveling ministry. The first part was part one, chapter one, and then he really dived into the first chunk of Jesus's traveling ministry. So I'm going to be starting that second part. So hold on to your horses, y'all. We are going to be from John 5 to John chapter 11, okay? Like I said, we're not hitting every single story. There's some amazing things we're just going to pass by, like Jesus walking on water, right? (laughs) Maybe him feeding 5,000. There's some things that we're not going to get to, but that's why we're encouraging you. Please, please, please at home be reading this along with us because there's so much goodness, amen? So at this point in his ministry, what we're going to see over and over and over today is that Jesus was making incredible waves. He was in a lot of trouble. He is saying all kinds of stuff. When we jump into this second part of Jesus' miracles and traveling ministry, he is making enemies of the, the big wigs in the church. He is making wild claims about being a Messiah, being the bread of life, being living water. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. You will have eternal life. And they're like, what in the actual world is going on, right? Nothing they have ever heard before. And some people are loving it. And some people are plotting a plan to kill Jesus. Spoiler alert, we all know what happens. (laughs) So we learn that these tensions are rising between religious leaders and the Messiah. The miracles that we see in the book of John follow a basic pattern. Jesus performs a sign or makes a claim about his divine identity saying, I am the son of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. And this results in sometimes a lot of misunderstanding or controversy. And in the end, everybody who hears has to make a choice if they're going to accept or reject what this Messiah, what Jesus is saying. So before we jump into this, let's just pause for a moment, okay? Because we are in the series about the life of Jesus. Like I said earlier, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The man God who came to earth as a man, fully human, fully God, because you and I could never work hard enough, be good enough, help enough people to counteract our sin, selfishness, anger, and greed, right? So he had to devise a plan to come for us. These stories are beautiful testimonies of what Jesus has done. But I know looking around this room, we could fill up a whole nother book with stories of what he's done for us in our lives. So even as we're reading about this Jesus and talking about how he's the illuminated presence of God and all the things we're going to get to, I do want us to remember, this is my best friend. This is your best friend. If you have a relationship with God, this is a man that you've known in a moment. Amen? I remember being eight years old. It made me think of, it's wild how 
the hardest times in my life, I felt him the closest. I remember being eight. I don't have a ton of vivid memories, but my youngest sister, Faith, had been in the NICU for six months. She was born incredibly premature. She had gotten out, had multiple infections. She had hydrocephalus at that point, had multiple shunts in her brain. And I remember I was old enough at this point, probably nine, where I could go in and see her after the surgery. And I wasn't prepared for what she would look like. My parents just, they had so much going on, understandably. I didn't know that they would shave her hair. She would have iodine over the stitches in her head. When we walked in, I thought it was blood. <laughs> and I was so shocked, so freaked out. But this was all happening internally. I was not, like, freaking out on the outside. Parents were going to her. She had just come out of brain surgery. I mean, their focus is her. And I, I removed myself from the room, and I sat in the hallway, and I was just crying. And a nurse walked by. She stopped down, and she talked to me. And it was what I needed in that moment as I look back now as an adult. I know that Jesus sent her to me, and I had this sweet, sweet presence of God with me in that moment. When people ask those questions, how do you know God is real? How do you know Jesus is real? Because he has always been with me. I can't explain it. All that I know is when I should have been at my worst, at my scaredest, he was there. This is the Jesus that we're reading about. I am sure you have had those moments in your life where an overwhelming peace an overwhelming sense of, I'm going to be okay. God's got this. He's with me, has overwhelmed you. And that's the person we're talking about today. Amen? Okay, so we're going to ask ourselves, as we're even looking through these stories, who is Jesus to me? Think of those stories where he has met you in your life. Amen? Okay, let's pray before we jump into the word. Dear Lord, this Bible, this truth is so incredibly holy. Let us not minimize it. Let us not glaze through it and not realize the power that it holds. Not only in the way that we get to know you and see you and trust you through these pages and these stories, but also speaking into us our lives, what we're struggling with right now. You know every need in this room, every heart cry, every high and every low. So this morning as we go through your word, Lord, let everything that leaves my lips be from you. Lord, thank you that you are with us. You are guiding us through this book of the Bible. Thank you that in it we can see ourselves and our story and the beautiful love letter that you have written to us. Amen. Amen. All right, so you guys ready to get in some scripture? So you can have a Bible open. If you got it on your phones, we're okay with that here. If you didn't put it, it's going to be on the screen, okay? So John 6, we're going to start off, and we're going to jump back one in a minute, but we're going to start off with John 6, 53 through 60. So Jesus here is talking about some crazy claims. And I love that we just got done taking communion because this is specifically what Jesus is talking about here. But no one has ever taken communion before. And they're like, what in the world is this crazy Jesus talking about now? Right? Okay. So John 6, 53 verses 60. I'm going to be reading this whole um, time out of the NIV, the um, NIV, okay? So, 53. Jesus said to them, uh-oh, y'all, here it goes. Very truly, I tell you, 
Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and will raise up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. You guys, could you imagine how this sounds? We know on the other side of the resurrection what this means. But in here, in this day, the Pharisees, the people of the church are like, this guy is off his rocker. Just 57, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. These stories have been passed down in the Jewish households and the Jewish traditions of Moses and the people of God, the Israelites, wandering and wandering and wandering, and yet they were fed bread every day that came from the sky, right? An amazing miracle. So Jesus is using this to say, "Uh -uh, no more. It's me. Trust in me. Believe in me, and you will have eternal life. I'm sure, whoop, right over their heads though, right? He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum, and on hearing it, Many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it, right? So we see that everybody was like, what? What is he saying, right? So this message, we're going to be looking at signs of the kingdom. Everybody say signs of the kingdom. Signs of the kingdom. And this is the first. Jesus is the healer and Passover lamb, okay? Jesus is the healer and Passover lamb. We see in John chapter 5, Jesus do something that everybody gets real up in arms about. He heals a paralyzed man on, does anybody know what day? The Sabbath. Uh Uh-oh. He starts a controversy with the Jewish leaders about working on the day of rest. Jesus says that his father is working on the Sabbath, and so is he. They catch his meaning. He was calling God his father, making himself equal with God. Oh, big stuff. Big stuff is happening. That's in John 5, verses 17 through 18. Jesus is answering about his authority as the son of God. And they want to kill him for this claim. To them, this is blasphemy. How can you be the Savior? You're just a man. We know where you grew up. We know your siblings. We know where you live, right? They want to kill him for this claim. And then chapter 6, where we had just read in the beginning, where he's talking about eating his flesh and drinking the blood. This is all taking place during the Passover feast. That's the feast where they celebrate and retell the Exodus story where they were spared, right? And they didn't lose their sons because they shed the blood of a lamb and they put it over their doorpost. So Jesus is coming and saying, it's me, guys. It's me, y'all. I'm the one you've been waiting for. On this occasion, Jesus miraculously also during this time provides food for a crowd of thousands. They talks about being the bread of life, the true bread. Now to us, you know, we might think, okay, bread, that's great. Like maybe we have it when we go to um, uh, Olive Garden. (laughs) Olive Garden's got garlic bread. And Red Lobster has Cheddar Bay biscuits, right? We have bread, you know, sometimes with a meal. But culturally, the Jewish culture, bread was it. It was cheap to make. You could survive on it. It had some nutrition. It had some calories. It had some carbs. And if you weren't rich enough to have meat or to be able to get expensive spices or whatever it was or grow your own, if you lived in the city, you had bread. It sustained these people. And so when they're hearing 
like I'm the new bread, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. What in the world are you talking about? But he is truly showing us, and we know now, that if you accept Jesus and he becomes a part of you, as in you accept him into your heart, you will have eternal life, right? Amen? This, though, because of the way he's describing it, it offends so many people. And there's a bunch who walk away and stop following him at this time because of this teaching. So the first sign that we see in this second section is Jesus is a healer and Passover lamb. The next one, you ready? Jesus is the illuminated presence of God. I know, big word. Jesus is the illuminated presence of God. This sign was huge for the kingdom. So now we don't have to make sacrifice anymore. We can accept Jesus into our lives. And if we've seen him, we know what God is like. Amen? That's a big deal. John 7, verses 37 through 39, that's the next place we're going to be. John 7, verses 37 through 39. In my Bible, the heading is Jesus goes to the festival of tabernacles. He's teaching. There's division over who Jesus is, unbelief of the Jewish leaders. There's a lot going on because of what he's teaching. It's, it's funny. In the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he tells his disciples, it's not time yet for me to reveal who I am. And we have definitely jumped into the section where he's revealing who he is, okay? So, John 7, 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of people showing up for this festival, you guys. Jesus stood in a loud voice. He said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. This sounds a lot like what Jesus said to the woman at the well that Pastor Spencer preached about a few weeks ago, right? He said that to her. He told his disciples it wasn't time for everybody to know, but in that moment, he had first revealed himself to this woman who is an outcast of society. And he said, if you drink the water I give you, you will never thirst again. But this time, he's standing up in the church at the festival and he says i am the living water come to me if you are thirsty this is a very very controversial thing to say he said whoever believes in me as scripture has said rivers of living water will flow from within them verse 39 By this he meant the spirit, John's letting us know, (laughs) whom those who believed in him were later to receive. He's giving a little like, you know, this is what's coming to the readers. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now look at if you guys go a little further in your Bible under this verse, the next little section says unbelief of the Jewish leaders. They're all asking Who is this man? Why did you bring him in? No one speaks like this. A mob knows nothing of the law. There's a curse on all of them. They're saying, look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So they're all just stirring, stirring, stirring in the Jewish church because of these claims that Jesus is making. Now go ahead, go down just a little bit to John 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So this sign that we see in him illuminating and being the illuminated presence of God, this is all a foreshadowing of Jesus saying, I am the life-saving gift of God to you, my people. 
once again, some accept it and some reject it. And as he gets more and more bold, this keeps happening and plots to kill him begin to form. But we have the same call, the same question every day. Are we going to accept or reject? And then if we accept, are we going to live our lives like that? Are we going to live our lives like I've got God, the Holy Spirit inside of me, and I talk to him about everything? I want him to know me. I want to know him. I want to draw closer. I want to live my life with others watching, illuminating God, right? The Bible says that we should be a bright light, a city on a hill. This is all that beautiful imagery that points to if you've got Jesus, there's just something different about us. Amen? The third sign, the last one we're going to talk about today. The third sign of the kingdom is a big one. A big one. Jesus is the author of life. Jesus is the author of life. We're going to jump into a really well-known story here. One of the biggest of Jesus' miracles because he raises a man who has been dead for three days, Lazarus, a friend of his, someone he knows and loves and cares about. So we are going to read this because this is such a powerful story. And it points not just to the fact that Jesus can do amazing things. There's all these beautiful things about this story. It points to the fact that Jesus can do miracles. He raised dead people to life. That's amazing. It points to the fact that we have eternal life, that if we accept Christ, we're never truly going to die. There's 100% wholeness, health, and healing for us in heaven one day. And it also points to the fact that Jesus intimately knew and cared about his friends. And when you have a relationship with him, he grieves with you. You guys know we see the shortest verse in the entire Bible here in this story. Jesus wept two words. He was about to raise this guy from the dead, and he still cried. Why? Because he was surrounded by people who were mourning his friend. And he was moved in that grief. He felt human grief like we all do. Don't think God is far from you in your grief. This was not his design. He designed Eden, right? Wholeness, health. But we experience grief here on earth because we live in a fallen, broken world. But he is near to you. He's not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of your whys and your shaking of your fists or your tears and your sadness and your wanting to get up. Give that to him because he's close to you. Okay? Let me read it. I should have said that after, but it's okay. John eleven thirty eight 38 through 44, the story of Lazarus. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Uh, But Lord, said Martha, which is Lazarus' sister, by this time there is a bad odor, (laughs) for he has been there for four days. She knows because she's been going in, taking care of the body. They didn't have like embalming and stuff back then. They would go in, they would wrap, they would put spices and oils on the body. It was a a rough situation. She knew. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? I'm sure she's thinking in her head, well, that's easy for you to say. My brother's been dead for three days, right? But they listened because it's Jesus. So they took away the stone. We're in verse 41. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they m- may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, "Lazarus, come out." And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face, and Jesus said to them, "Take off the grave clothes and let him go. 
Jesus calls him back to life and out of his tomb, knowing that this will cost him his life. Knowing that at this point, this is the beginning of the end of Jesus' story on earth. He raised a dead man who bunches and bunches of people, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, were wealthy siblings, well-known supporters of Jesus, financially helped support his ministry. These are the same people that we hear the Mary and Martha story, where um, one is sitting at Mary's feet and the other one is busy, or Jesus' feet, and the other one is busy doing all the things. This is the same exact family, well-known, loved by Jesus, Tons of people there mourning this man. And Jesus raises him from the dead. The news of this amazing sign spread quickly. And just as Jesus knew would happen, the Jerusalem leaders hear about it and then immediately conspire to murder him. This is the first time we see in scripture that they're like, okay, that's it. He has got to go. The miracles are so great. And his claims now are so true that the religious leaders want him dead. And this is where we end this Sunday. We see it in John 11, 45 through 48, the plot to kill Jesus. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, they believed in him. But some of them rejected. It's not in there, but that some of them rejected. They went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. The chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. That's the who is who of the Jewish church. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. And with this Last story in this section, we see the first half of John drawing to a close as Jesus literally lays down his life in an act of love in raising his friend, knowing that at this point, there's no going back. He said who he is. He's backed it up with what he's done. And Jesus is the only one who knows what's next, right? but still he does it anyway. This is another sign, of course, pointing towards the cross, the three days and the resurrection. But in the end, no one there knew. Many celebrated, followed Jesus, like the Bible says in John, because of him raising Lazarus, but many decided to walk away and to reject him and everything that he stood for because it was so wild. It was so different. It was so unlike anything anybody had ever said or seen. And this is the same exact Jesus who's with you, 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 me. It's the same exact man right? The one we can trust to, hold on to, cling to. The one who is our ever-present help in times of need. And so we get to see that beyond a healing, which is a miraculous miracle, he has come to sacrifice himself for us so that we can be our own Lazarus, so that we can be Barabbas, you know, the guy who they were like, give us, you know, give us Barabbas. Put Jesus on the cross. That's what I was talking about when I said we can see ourselves in this. Because time and time again, we see stories of healing and sacrificing and Jesus saying, if you just put your trust and your faith in me, you will have eternal life. You will have so much more here on this earth than you could ever imagine. And so much more after life in death than you can imagine. Amen? 
So if you would stand with me as we close, we're just going to pray. I don't know what it is that you're facing today that you just need to give to Jesus. Or maybe you just feel so far from him in this moment. Or maybe it's something dead in your life that you need raised, for lack of a better way to explain it, like a relationship or maybe a dream you've had that you put to rest, but that's never quite left your heart. Whatever it is, we want to pray for you for those specific situations this morning. So if you all could close your eyes. If you have something you need prayer for, if you could lift your hand. We're going to pray this prayer all together over these situations. It doesn't matter how big. It doesn't matter how small. It's big to God. So let's pray this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are the bread of life. You are our sustainer, our creator. You are our healer, our provider. You are everything that we need and more. And in following you, we have more than we could ever imagine. But this life throws so much at us, so much brokenness, so much death and disease, all of the things, whether it's relationships, mental health, work, our marriage, our kids, our families, our friendships, whatever it is, life has a way of tripping us up and throwing the nastiest things at us. But you are the God who cares, who weeps with us, who sits with us, who knows us. And the only way that we can know that apart from scripture is your presence and feeling that overwhelming, unexplainable peace in the midst of brokenness. So Lord, we thank you this morning for healing in these situations. Whatever it is unspoken, we don't all have to know because you know. You are there. You are close to us, drawing near in this time. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us the strength to lay these things at your feet and say, Lord, whatever your will for this situation is, whatever your timing, whatever your plan, it might not look like what we thought it would be, but in the end, you are with us and we can trust you. And so we lay those things at your feet today, and we just continue to accept you as Lord of our lives, that you can do so much more with that than we ever could. And so, Lord, we trust you with those things this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, as we close, once again, next Sunday, Pastor Spencer, it's going to get heavier as we get closer to the cross but then the glorious resurrection amen but please stick with this because it is just a beautiful beautiful reminder of why we do this every Sunday why we throw out chairs and pop up signs and come together in a middle school it's all because of Jesus we are over 2,000 years past this guy dying and raising from the dead and all across this nation on Sunday morning whether it's a no time difference or whatever there are people gathering in his name because he's real and all of this has become so real to each one of us but there's so many people out there who still need to hear that amen so we're not going to let the time pass as we close like we usually do if you could close your eyes, bow your heads, if there's anyone in here who does not know Jesus or needs to rededicate their lives to Jesus, we are going to do a salvation prayer. And what that does is that's just you accepting Jesus into your heart, saying you want a relationship with this God that we sang about, talked about, took communion about, this Jesus man. You're accepting him into your heart. So if that's you, you can raise your hand today. And then we're all going to pray a prayer together. If you are online and you want to accept Jesus, send us a message and pray this prayer with us here now. 
Everybody repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I accept you as Lord of my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that even if it was just for me, you would have done it. So today I put my faith in you and I walk this life out following you and what you would have for me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Awesome, awesome. What a beautiful time of getting to come together, worship, take communion, and then get to learn what those exact words meant to hear Jesus say them himself through the scripture. We'll close our last way of worship like we always do. That's through giving. If you are a regular attender of Story Church, this is the time to give. There's all the ways to give as most churches have online or in person. You can drop it in a bucket. But we are just so thankful that we get to use our finances as a church to expand the kingdom of God. We love that our lease here at the school goes directly towards the school. And we're just so thankful for these three years that we have been here in this middle school. This is not our forever home. We do see something one day, right? That's for Story Church. But in this time, we get to beautifully steward this space. And as they begin staff returns, we want them to feel that this is a safe place, a holy place. Our worship and our prayer affects this. And we get to also use our finances to steward that and, and to give that and expand the kingdom in that way. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. You are released. We hope you have an amazing, amazing day. And we pray that you have an awesome week. Thank you, guys. Lead me to the cross.